Great to be here again. It's a beautiful day here in the valley, except that we have forest fires causing a lot of smoke mm. in the valley, but otherwise it's quite nice. Uh, I've got a great topic tonight. You know, the, there's been a lot of discussion, ongoing discussion in the field about whether restorative justice can address structural and racial injustice. But this is going to be a unique, a unique perspective. We have uh, a neuroscience perspective here. So I'm eager to hear uh, what, this is, what, this, what Cheryl has to say. And our guest today is Cheryl Talley. I'm honored to present her here. Uh, Cheryl is at Virginia State University now in the graduate program. Uh, from the faculty there, but here in Harrisonburg at James Madison University. Uh, and she was very active in this community, and she was on our board of reference for a long time. And we really valued her participation uh, in that. But she got there from the University of Virginia. Her, her uh, specialty, her focus was in psychology, but particularly biopsychology. Uh, she got her master's degree there, too. And as I say, she was on the faculty at James Madison prior to this uh, her current position. She has a number of awards and uh, publications. I won't go through all that, although I will note that she has a Distinguished Service Award uh, from the College of Integrated Science and Technology at James Madison University. Uh, so as, as Sarah said, uh, Cheryl's going to talk for a while. Send your questions and comments in to me all throughout this. And uh, we will sort of, after she's presented, we will have time to have this conversation based on the questions you have. So thank you very much. And Cheryl, take it from here. All right, Howard. I just want to ask patients a question about uh, my shared screen once again. OK, here it is. I'm good. There we have it. Can everyone see it? Am I okay? Yeah, you're good here. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Howard. It's a pleasure to be with you and to be uh, associated with um, CJP. I've really valued my collaboration with colleagues there and uh, I miss you guys. So uh, today I am going to talk about restorative justice from a neuroscience perspective. And I hope to provide you with some ideas about the significant role that restorative justice can play in our social discourse about crime. Starting with Rodney King and culminating with Trayvon Martin, we have not as of yet as a nation had much discourse about crime and the role of police and the criminal justice system as it intersects with race. There is a lot, there are, there's a lot of talking, but not a lot of discourse. I think we're still shouting at each other. But that provides an opportunity for, for restorative justice. It's just the type of movement that can help create the discourse. Uh, but for that to happen, I think um, RJ must also examine the possibility of redefining perpetrator and victim from a personal context to a social context. So I've just returned from China where I gave a presentation on a curriculum that, uh, that I use called Education and Human Values. I'm not it at the end of this presentation. Um, it is with my work uh, with Project Knowledge, which is a um, academic intervention funded by the National Science Foundation. I mentioned it here at the outset because um, I began a t that talk in China with an apology for the scientific method. Um, and as you will see from this conversation, the scientific method has produced some amazing technologies and has allowed us to ask and to answer all kinds of questions about the universe. However, it has limitations when it comes to questions of our place in the universe. And so I would say, uh, take a word of caution, even from the outset of putting too much faith in my own presentation. Neuroscience is actually the brain studying itself. And so we have to be aware of the limitations of our lens. I chose this Prezi template because um, it, it reminded me of lenses. Um, and it, 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 it had, provides a visual of depth. So the circles remind me of lenses, like that of a microscope, allowing us to peer into different levels of analysis. We're going to examine some things very closely. 
So, uh, but at the same time, we must not forget the fact that when some things come into focus, other things go out of focus. So with that, I've taken a few slides from my courses, Teach Introduction to Neuroscience. Um, and uh, we all know what affective is, but let's talk about what uh, neuroscience. So when I teach neuroscience, I also put a disclaimer in the course. I'm going to lay out the systematic and, and logical progression. But when we look at nature, there are many other shapes and certainly will be described as a logical. But because this is a scientific method, it does provide us with a common language, a chart, and a systematic way of looking at it. Oh, and um, affective neurosciences is a new take on this field. Um, and I've, I like this uh, definition, although I'm, I'm kind of confused by it, because most of the time neuroscientists don't like to use the word mind. Uh, mind is not easy to define. When I was first in neuroscience about 10 years, you seemed to be more, more on exactly what the field was and wasn't. Um, but basically, it is looking at behavior as a function of biology. So I found this definition on Wikipedia. Uh, if you're going to scroll through the social neuroscience lens, then you have to think about this as functions of biology. So the theories, the data that you use have to um, appropriate themselves and be associated with biology. And that, that means that you look at even social evolution uh, in terms of diets, families, clans, et cetera, as, as biology. The premise of our talk is it is this from which we will have today. So if biological systems implement social behaviors and all of human behavior can be explained by biological mechanisms, then what does that have to do with restorative justice? That's going to be our big question. So the only reason that we can have this uh, conversation about effective neuroscience is because of technology. 30 years ago, we couldn't have even had a talk like this because the technology was not as sophisticated. Uh, there, was a, there was EEG that allowed for listening to brain activity, but visuals such as this, this, FMR, this MRI scan, was not even possible. I mean, it must have seemed just amazing to be able to watch a living human brain, uh, you know, while you're asking a person to think of something. That's what this technology allows us to do. There are many, many ways to view beyond EEG and fMRI. There's fMRI functional MRIs, MRIs that just give you like a photograph, CAT scans, PET scans. These machines all were designed to help with medical diagnoses, but the value to science invest, scientific investigation was noted from the very beginning. What happened is that these technologies allow the data. So brain cells communicate with each other in a process called synaptic transmission. And the method of communication is both an electrical one and a chemical one. And so we refer to activation of neurons as cell firings. So you can see uh, on this illustration um, that you can take pictures of different uh, regions of the brain when the cells are firing for different individuals. Here at the bottom right, there's a comparison group, a pair comparison within, with a meta methamphetamine user and one who does it. So with the ability to collect so much data, one can then create models and that help explain brain function from uh, a theory. So an early theory was this model of the triune brain. This model of evolution um, was proposed by the American physician and neuroscientist Paul McLean. The beauty of this theory is that it created a much simpler way to conceptualize the vast complexity of brain activity 
by focusing in on the major structures of the cortex and the brain stem. The tri in triune brain comes from the fact that mammals, the brain, in, in mammals, the brain stem is separated from the cortex by structures associated with emotion. This is that mammals, um, emer the mammalian brain emerged from the reptilian brain uh, by way of, of adapting feelings for the young. You know, in mammals, they give birth one or two helpless and defenseless young, whereas sea turtles give birth to lots of eggs and immediately uh, covers them up and goes back into the sea. Uh, for mammals to stick around and care for these uh, youngsters for two years or four years or some cases 21 years, um, there has to be some feeling of attachment. And so the limbic system is said to have developed so that uh, to accommodate this. Though, are pointing to more, a more dynamic nature of brain activity. And it's not so much the specific brain site that tells the story, but the traffic, the traffic, patterns, the firing between different sites that seem to be the most important. Here's an example of how this technology can be used in application. Uh, looking at two groups of students, one of my colleagues, esteemed colleagues, Dr. Oliver Hill here at uh, Virginia State. He's looking at how brains of high performing students seem to exert not too much effort on a simple task as compared to brains of lower performing students. Uh, this information has actually been helpful to us and it's informing our uh, academic intervention that is focused purely on affective factors. There is no remediation or tutoring or anything in project knowledge. Um, it's really being informed by this type of research. So enough of that. What has all of this has to do with restorative justice? Well, at the outset, I disclaimed that we were going to examine restorative justice through the lens of biology. So restorative justice is the action of brains. Uh, crime is the action of brains. Uh, arresting people is the action of brains. Um, all the adjudication is the action of brains. So the first principle of restorative justice is about a violation. Crime is fundamentally a violation of people and interpersonal relationships. But looked at through the lens of biology, two questions. What is restorative justice doing to brains? And what happens when crime is against a community or a social group and not just a person? So what happens? Let's start with that second question. What happens when a community is violated and the perpetrator feels like the state? I don't have to tell this audience that this is not an easy question to answer. There are many confounds. So a confound is something uh, in science that mixes with your variable in question and clouds the issue because it's difficult to distinguish it, pull it out from the thing that you're actually studying. But we know from the literature that crime has associating factors. So as, I, as often happens when you're working in the biological experiment, you have to stop the initial investigation and consider these confounds and then come back to your initial question with more clarity. So that's what I'll do right now. So if we're looking at the confounds of education, poverty, and representation within the criminal justice system. Uh, sometimes, you know, when I was in graduate school, an experiment wasn't working down the hall into another lab and asked someone for help, someone who knew about the equipment problem or the animal model or, or was just there to have a conversation to distract me uh, to get help. So for our problem with confounding factors, I went down the hall to Harvard and I got some information from Dr. Robert Sampson. Dr. Sampson is not a biologist, he is a sociologist. He is the Henry Ford II Professor of the Social Sciences at Harvard, and his vita is 26 pages long. So I thought I could trust that he knows what he's talking about when it comes to examining crime. He examines it the same way that a biologist studies plants. He uses careful and deliberate observation to capture data, 
create bottles and confirm a theory. This is one of his conclusions. Crime is more likely to occur when an individual's bond to society is attenuated. So uh, let's take that back to the lab. So how might an individual's body, bond to society be attenuated? Well, that's an interesting question. So I need to get some answers from a few others before resuming my own inquiry. But from my investigations from the literature, these three factors, education, poverty, and representation within the criminal justice system, have been used to disassociate people. Crime in the United States is associated with historical oppression because anywhere you can look at crime, you cannot separate it, in my reading, from social class and race. So one theory is that uh, education is an instrument which is used to facilitate integration of the younger generation into the logic of the present system to bring about conformity. Uh, the lab down the hall from Paulo su suggests that educational caste systems exist to keep and maintain social disparity. That's an interesting hypothesis. That provides us with some data along with Tanahisi Coates in a case for reparations. He says, with segregation, with the isolation of the injured and the robbed, comes the concentration of disadvantage. An unsegregated America might see poverty and all its effects spread across the country with no particular bias towards skin color. Instead, the concentration of poverty has been paired with a concentration of melanin. So he provides um, in this writing more evidence that, that race, education, wealth are all confounded. In the uh, work from Michelle Alexander, she points out that today there are more African Americans under correction, prison or jail, or pro on probation or parole than there were enslaved in 1850, a decade before the Civil War. There are millions of African Americans now cycling in and out of prisons and jails and under correctional control. In major American cities today, more than half of working age African American men are either under correctional control or branded felons and thus subject to legalized discrimination for the rest of their lives. Wow. So, what are we to do with all of this? So I mentioned at the introduction that there are limitations to using the lens. You can't always see the bigger picture. You can't always see other pictures. Uh, and the interpretation that I've taken from this data is not the only interpretation. For instance, uh, I was looking at the Washington Post database yesterday of police shootings, and it shows that last year there were nearly 1,990 deadly shootings in the police, by the police in the U.S. Most of the time, the victim is not an unarmed black man, but a white man and who's armed. Most of the time, there was probable cause. So also, I read a National Review article titled, A Case Against Reparations. It wasn't as convincing to me as what uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates wrote about, but because what Coates wrote about aligned with my own experience and opinions, um, it was easy for me to um, discount the National Review. So my own biases are part of the experiment. I must be aware that I am not impartial. So from a lens, I now step to stepping stones. So a lens perspective acknowledges that there is one way to see things. I acknowledge that. Stepping stones presuppose a known destination and a logical stepwise progression. So there is nothing more logical than mathematics, which leads me to ask this question. If biology is not fair, and psychology is really biology, then why should I expect psychology to render fairness? Why should I expect the criminal justice system to be fair, to be any different than what it is. Why do I have that expectation? Well, according to biology, I should not have that expectation because tribe is the beginning of or the origin of brain and all social structures according to evolution. Imagine yourself back 50,000 years ago, 
Homo sapiens had been around for about 150,000 years. And by that time, uh, about that time, there was a sudden explosion of manufacturing. We know that because there are lots of tools and artifacts that are left behind as evidence. Homo sapiens as the winner in evolution, and one theory is because they figured out how to live in community. E.O. Wilson, a renowned biologist, describes tribe or the appearance of you social behavior as the most important thing we owe to our existence. The ability to live in community with assigned roles increased our chance of survival. As a matter of fact, um, we are one of just a very few species, ants, locusts, and uh, I think one of my students reminded me the naked mole rat that actually live in communities with assigned roles. You can read more about that from uh, E.O. Wilson. So from a biological perspective, one needs skill. And for the early human, skill required a rotating thumb. The thumb was associated with the ability to make tools. Tools helped to secure resources. So perhaps an educational caste system that robs one of a very basic, instinctive, primordial desire to attain resources for oneself and one's group. However, in keeping an educational caste system, one protects resources from another group. That is a perspective. What about access to staples? Our early ancestors had simple needs, but they were truly needs. They needed to be protected from the elements and from predators. They needed warmth, shelter, and food. Those that attained these things survived, and we are their descendants. Those that did not attain these things did not survive, and they have no descendants. Today, our needs are much more complex, but perhaps there is still a primordial, primordial desire to secure safety for us and our kind. And then this leads me to the final element that EO says was essential to our survival as a species, fire. And not just fire, but the campfire. It is not strange that these artifacts and tools that our early ancestors left behind are always found around fire pits. We sat around fires in a circle, and I believe that this is where we first began to confer identity upon one another. We told stories to ourselves. I imagine a pitch black night with the sound of wild things coming from the trees behind us, but there in the glow of the warmth and with a full stomach and with a family nearby, civilization started. Who would we be without the stories we tell ourselves? Well, I say we wouldn't be. We all are our narrative. The brain requires information and the first information we get is about our, who we are within our tribe. I showed this MRI scan at earlier, and I bring it back here to consider the idea that if psychology is biology, sorry, if psychology is biology, then the protection of tribal identity is an innate part of brain. It is responsible for our evolution. Our tribe identity drove our desire to survive and to be the fittest as a species. So using this stepping stone logic though, let's see where tribal identity will lead us. Here from my studies, and this is just a, a couple of a large body of literature that suggests that bias is hardwired into the brain. Um, you could understand that under, knowing an in-group versus an out-group had evolutionary advantage. Um, a child who didn't prefer his or her own, own group uh, among our homo sapien ancestors was at the risk of being clubbed to death. So the human brain has been found to categorize people by race in the first one-fifth of a second. And you can see here from a study, and I've given the citation below, of how, e how at three months old, race preference is apparent. As we grow older, necessarily get better. Uh, now, there's a tendency for people to confirm their own preconceptions or hypotheses, independently of whether or not they are true or not. 
people can reinforce these attitudes by selectively collecting new evidence, by interpreting the evidence they already have in a biased way, or by selecting, selectively recalling information from memory. So another inquiry, how might implicit bias influence a white police officer to stop a car for a traffic violation? In that split second that's used to decide, I'm going to stop this car and not that car, what implicit bias could be happening under conscious awareness? Or another question, how might confirmation bias influence a grand jury in a police shooting case? If uh, evidence from the case is used uh, to just confirm what people already think about the perpetrator or about the victim, then um, how might confirmation bias be being played out? Again, under conscious awareness. And you can read more about this in this very interesting book, um, Unfair, The New Science of Criminal Injustice. So what are we to make of this? What logical conclusion can be drawn from this evidence? Well, here's some conclusions from a biological perspective. Bias is a part of the human brain. We all have bias. Our bias is hidden even from us and our cultural narrative transfers our bias. However, if we want a different outcome, we have to think of things in a different way, so says a very smart scientist. So I'm gonna give you now some wild ways to think, and these are wild. Uh, the idea that we are still evolving, and this notion that we consciously affect our evolution as a species. Several years ago, when I first began my own inquiry into this new way of thinking, I discovered the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and here there were scientists using the scientific method to investigate phenomenon of the natural world that could not be explained. I discovered Barbara Mark's book, Conscious Evolution, where she essentially claims that the same way that the brain evolved to support us as tribal, we could consciously act to foster a communal sense of being. And this is a wild thought. But then it got wilder because I came across Rupert Sheldrake and his idea of morphic resonance. Now, he suggests that nature itself is conscious. Neuroscience has not been able to define consciousness in any reasonable way, despite all of the high-tech equipment. I joined him in an inquiry of this idea. Uh, I should just also say that his TED Talk has been banned. Uh, I'll let you read for yourself how the traditional scientific community views his work, um, especially his book, The Science Delusion, where he essentially calls scientists uh, religious fanatics. But um, we don't have time to go into that now, but it's a really, really interesting discussion. So when you begin to think outside the box like this, the box like this, logic will no longer help you. There is no logical progression to an unknown destination. So from a lens, we went to stones, stepping stones, and now the stepping stones to me become bubbles. They are emanating from some deep ocean. Some, there are some signs that there is something out there, something, something beckoning, something that's deeper, past our biological tendencies to label, to judge, and to restrict. And I say that the power of the circle process gets us to it. I bring you back to that primordial campfire. What was really going on there? The cultural narrative was being implanted for sure, but something else too. I believe that there was a state of being that invited calmness, openness, and receptivity. That as we watch the embers rise to the sky and watch the sky and the vastness, the vastness of it, perhaps they experience, those early Homo sapiens experience something we don't, which is complete oneness with it all. Many authors have indicated, uh, researchers, an integral leak and link between a person's personality and the function of the prefrontal cortex. So I bring you now back to the idea of the triune brain. 
So this cortex, the, where the medial prefrontal cortex is the last to have evolved. And it is really the part of the brain that makes humans unique. It's involved in personality expression, decision-making, moderating social behaviors, and executive function. The brainstem, on the other hand, and I'm pointing to the limbic system, uh, which is at the top of the brainstem, between the brainstem and the cortex, is evolved in fear, anger, and aggression. But it is possible to temper that. It is it's impossible to get impressions from the amygdala of which, that which um, indicate you should be afraid or threatened, and then give it more information by information coming from the medial prefrontal cortex and, and so uh, sympathetic nervous system response to fear. So in essence, um, instead of the amygdala signal informing your behavior and, and dictating your behavior, you sort of usurp or um, stop the amygdala's control and uh, act in a different way. So we know that this happens, that you can actually change the brain by changing the way you think. The best evidence comes from seminal studies like this one. Buddhist monks were shown to have different brain activity than novice meditators. Um, however, novice meditators' brains could like the monks' brains with the practice of focused attention. Now, I'm not saying that we'll get there because these uh, Buddhist monks had about 40,000 hours of meditation under their belt, but it was clear that their brain activity was permanently altered by the, med the act of meditating. So what if the same type of brain changes seen on an individual level can be produced in the social context? I believe that is what's happening in a situation where there is activation of moral imagination, such as in circle processes, restorative justice conversations, and in education for human values. Peace on earth only will be a lofty phrase as long as we think of ourselves as separate tribes. Our brains will not allow us to have peace with the other. It is biologically maladaptive to have peace with an outside tribe. However, if the other is subsumed into our own tribe, well, that's a different situation entirely. The same mechanisms that are used to protect and provide for our own will become enlarged if everyone else was also in our tribe. This requires great imagination for sure, moral imagination as John Letterbach writes about in his book. Uh, peace building, in his view, is both a learned skill and an art. Finding this art, he says, requires a worldview shift. Conflict professionals must envision their work as a creative act, an exercise in moral imagination. So as I come out of this inquiry, having gone from a lens to a stepping stone to bubbles, I draw your attention to the shape of the kauru. Howard taught me about this in his, on his office door. He has a similar a photo with, this, with a similar shape. And from Wikipedia, this shape means uh, the growth, strength, and peace. It comes from a Maori symbol, and it's an integral part of their art. It helps to convey the idea of perpetual movement, while the inner coil suggests a return to the point of origin. As an example. So if we allow uh, nature to be our guide, then there is one guiding tenet in nature. Nothing comes from nothing. Nihil fit ex nihilo in the Latin. Uh, education in human values is an educational pedagogy that's, that starts with the premise that love, truth, peace, right action, and, and nonviolence are inherent parts of the human being, just like tribe. Um, the idea is that as you teach a child from this perspective, drawing these good qualities out from them, then you get behaviors that are associated with it. So think of 
the possibility that what restorative justice and circle processes are doing are connecting to these inherent values that would have us care for each other, express dignity to each other, respect, humility, honesty, appreciation of other cultures and an unwillingness to hurt. What if these, we assumed that this was a natural part of human existence? Education and Human Values was uh, created in India, and it's been used all over the world. I found out about it um, from uh, people who actually had started a school in Australia. And what I've noticed right away is that the places where they've been successful in instigating and in instituting it were uh, places that were not a lot, had, did not have a lot of resources. And as you see, the United States doesn't have um, any schools that have this curriculum operating. There, there's, there are five teaching methodologies that are used, and I just want to speak about them quickly because I believe that they use the brain in a unique way. There are all, so you, the value is the point of focus, and the value is actually taught with every subject. So that's unique. But what's more, the lessons always include teaching techniques that employ an affirmation, a memorized affirmation or scripture, a song, a narr an emotive narrative, a group activity where people move their bodies, and silent sitting or med meditation. This metacognitive technique has, I've seen, taught to five-year-olds. So a room full of kindergarten sitting for a whole minute in complete stillness. This ability to self-regulate, uh, then when added to the affirmation, the song, the kinesthetic memory, uses all parts of the brain, mostly in the cortex. So you're training children to actually not necessarily act on impulses using from fear and threat, but from their own moral imagination. I talked about this at a conference that I recently attended in China, where the Chinese are interested in uh, implementing this SSCHV uh, in Chinese schools. Now, there's just uh, one professor who runs an institute, but he's getting a lot of traction because the, you know, the Chinese have been dealing with corruption. And in a society in which uh, religious, religion is not advocated, there's an understanding that um, some kind of value is necessary. And it was interesting, the teachers, the principals, the administrators had, um, were very, very interested in the whole idea of education and human values. So, as for the role of restorative justice, I see an expanded role. It's the job of taking the practices, the inquiry, the use of moral in imagination, circle processes, as tribe expanding techniques. Tribe expanding techniques into the criminal justice system itself, not just with the victims and offenders, but with law enforcement, the legal system, all the way up to the Supreme Court. Because where there's a human, there is a brain. And where there's a brain, there is a tribal affiliation. No person is immune, so our work is cut out for us. But if we believe that humans are more than biology, then the force that is behind the creation of the cosmos propels us forward to the next better version of ourselves as a species. Someone said the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Can restorative justice address structural and racial injustice? I believe it can. I believe it must. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Cheryl. It's a lot to think about here. We have one question, which I'll go to, but I want to encourage people to send in more. Uh, uh, let me, I, I'm not sure my question is very well formed, but I, um, to use a little bit different language than you have, there are there's two different parts of us on neurological functions. Empathy on one hand and othering, <laughs> creating the other with the other. On the other side, empathy is what we believe makes partly what makes restorative justice work. 
Mm -hmm. It's the thing that makes punishment and war and our, our uh, punishment, war, our uh, tolerance of poverty, those kinds of things, um, tolerable. Uh, I'm distracted by the changing here, but sorry, I'm back again. That's okay. <laughs> so there's a good, uh, so you part answered this, but what can we do to overcome these two tendencies? Or to put it in other terms, there's a an evolutionary biologist, if I remember correctly, who looks at functions such as forgiveness and revenge and so forth, and argues that, that in human evolution, all of those things are functional in certain circumstances. Mm. That if we're going to bring out the more positive, we need to change the circumstances which will call forth that function is where does that fit in how do we change the can we change the conditions that call forth othering to circumstances that call forth empathy and i guess that's partly what you're saying through the restorative process any any general comments on that rambling question <laughs> well uh howard i i don't i don't know how one could change conditions without changing one's perspective because the motivation to change conditions is suspect all the time. <laughs> um, I think our culture provides us much practice for the othering and much less practice. And um, if you look at it from a com just a brain perspective, uh, the, the, the brain pathways that get the most use are the easiest to use. So if we practice and practice and practice othering, then when we're asked to be in the struggle. And I think what this education in human values would suggest that if we train children and adults, we're using this um, in our intervention here at Virginia State also, if you train people and give them tools in which to practice empathy, then it becomes easier in our culture. Uh, maybe related to that, see what you think of this. I heard a neuro, neuro, neuroscientist say that because the brain is wired to connect with other people, that is a natural flow. And if you can create a context where empathy happens, that reprograms us quicker because that is what's built into the brain. How do and that I agree. Happen? I absolutely agree. And that is exactly what the restorative uh, justice context provides. But just think what it takes to get that and how few people are willing to put themselves in the seats. That's true. Yeah. Okay. But I absolutely agree with them. I, I, I think it was um, evolutionarily adaptive to us for forgiveness in terms of keeping the cohesion of our tribe. Because just think about what it would be like if our tribe didn't work. Uh, we wouldn't have survived either. So there, we do bring the skills of tribal cohesion. Is when our limited and there's a whole tribe out there yeah that makes sense well the questions are flowing in now okay uh, here, here we go uh rochelle arms asked sorry if i missed this but have any uh fmri scans been done with people pre and post circle processes I've, I've heard that heard that many. Yeah. communication skills don't have to be taught as much as we need to create environments and actually bring out people's innate need capacity to connect with others. It's a bit like the question I was asking. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know of any studies like that. Uh, these, are, these are expensive studies. And um, uh, you know the reason that you were able to see that with the monks is because that's a lifelong uh, practice for them, those 40,000 hours. So you'd probably have to see something on the magnitude of 40,000 hours of, of circle processing to uh to be able to just visualize it for you know in, with our current technology it did occur to me from what you were saying that maybe one strategy for reducing police violence would be to have police meditate more i agree <laughs> <laughs> all right we get a question from new zealand uh i'm not quite sure how it connects to our topic so maybe you'll figure it out kiara or kelly manning and kiara greetings from new zealand has there been much research in America around Native Americans in the justice system? And of course there has, but I don't know if it's been related to this issue or not. Do you? Yes. Um, what I can tell you, what I've, been, what I've looked at with um, 
psychological research with Native Americans are this similar system of pathology. So this whole idea of oppressed people, um, that's a real thing because some of the markers that we see and, and normally associate with uh, African Americans being uh, just the gap in achievement, high levels of criminality, how the, the, the numbers that are associated with poverty, those are, they're similar numbers with Native Americans. Observations prior this research has taken place. And also I could add with Native Hawaiians, uh, not, not immigrants to Hawaii, not Asian immigrants to Hawaii, but Native Hawaiian. You see the same type numbers there. So there's something about the narrative when it's changed about your culture, your tribe, um, and it's devalued by the oppressing force or the dominant force, um, it becomes internalized, I believe. And these uh, and the work then for changing the situation, I, I believe, comes from that internal desire to regain what was lost. All right, thank you. Brian Vaughn sends greetings to both of us, and he's in Fredericksburg. He says, can you comment on how the RJ can impact the school to prison pipeline in a positive manner? I've been fortunate to work with Virginia organizing in Fredericksburg trying to address this dynamic. So, Yeah, well, as I said, um, I believe that judges, prosecutors, I believe this conversation needs to be expanded to them. And I've been in some of those conversations. You know, I gave a, a, a talk to um, the Department of Criminal Justice in Richmond. Um, there is some resistance when the approach is, I know that this is a way to prove it. You know what I'm saying? So there's, <laughs> there's some resistance when you come at it from that way. Um, so I don't know what a new perspective could be that would have been enrolling other than there is benefit in all of our humanity when we open up these channels of empathy and compassion like we because we are all suffering whether whether you're in prison or or you're putting people in prison um, just our culture in general is affected negatively so I think it, it is it behooves us as as a as a country and as a because as ultimately all the ailments in the world can be traced to tribal affiliations it is not being a tribe is is difficult and and it takes a whole different framework it takes it takes different ways of com of different types of conversations different words and certainly different ways of relating to each other so i would like to see restorative justice create a just not perpetrator and crime is in their crosshairs, but the the whole structure of the criminal justice system, because I believe that it it's it, it's all it's all of humanity's work. You know, some commentators have noted that when we are threatened, we we return to our tribe. Yeah. And in an era, era an age where where so much fear, it helps to explain too why tribes become so important. Right. Uh, April Bang is wondering if you could give examples of interventions or educational practices that foster or strengthen people's capacity for empathy. Well, I'll some education and human values that um, I attended a training in the UK in which there were people from um, girls' schools in Egypt, from an AIDS orphanage orphanage in Nigeria, where this uh, is these children have been traumatized. And this ability to teach reading by first engaging them on this deeper level. I mean, it, it's, an, it's an amazing thing. To, I just saw it on videos, but it, it is simply amazing to see five-year-olds sit, sit in meditation and then also um, talk about them hearing their inner voice, their, um, as one child put it, uh, my, heart, my heart talking. That, that intuitive part of humanness that is so often overlooked in our culture. When that becomes a part of an educational experience, 
I think that it is it is life it is it is paradigm shifting, not even life changing, paradigm shifting. Uh, Selena Garcia says the alternatives to violence project. Now, oops, everyone comes in here, it pops it, the whole thing changes, and it disappears. <laughs> The Alternatives to Violence Project, now in some 40 countries, does include all the humane values you mentioned. Great. It works in USA and many schools, and I would add prisons. Mm -hmm. A specialized program for schools works in many parts of the U.S. We use it in Costa Rica and other countries. And just, uh, so that's sort of an example of what, yeah. you're, what you were talking about there. Right. Um, Valerie Bloom says, a great lesson learned today. Thank you, Cheryl. My question, do you believe that the reason we have such a surplus in negative or degenerative perspectives, as some would say, is because we have bi biologically, and there goes the question, Helen, is we have biologically altered these behaviors by like asserting peace, patience, and self-reflecting? Yes, I, I believe that the brain uh, wires through practice. Um, why, should, why should our behaving in, an, in a humane way be any different biologically from learning how to ride a bicycle? Uh, by, and the biological substrates are exactly the same. So what, pra what you practice, you get better at. The more you do it, it gets easier to do. Um, I think in our culture, we have so much threat. It, even our, our, even our entertainment is threat. So, so we have, we practiced that, uh, those brain pathways, if you will. And what RJ provides us is, um, the practicing of something else in a social context. I know we can do it as a personal context. We can have our personal practices, but restorative justice brings this out into the light, you know, into into community, where and and creates community in a context even then you know in the criminal justice system where there wasn't community before it got arrived, and that ability I think is its greatest strength. There's John Stevenson asks, are you familiar with the metaphor within each person, the harsh wolf and the kind wolf, a representation of two evolutionary capacities, one that is with threat assessment and security, the second that allows us to develop empathy, love, and compassion. Uh, the reference he gives is how God changes your brain. The good news is that there are eight practices we can do to help feed the wolf, the kind wolf within us. <laughs> you know that one? No, I've never heard that. I've heard that somewhere, but I wasn't acquainted with it. So thank you, John, for that. Um, Amy Fol Siebert asked, do, do you feel there or is there research to suggest that the perception of zero-sum resources in our environment has primed our brain to limit our tribe affiliation? Would we be more inclined to see the whole human race as a tribe as if we had unlimited resources or a feeling that our needs would be more met fairly? I certainly believe that if we believed that we had unlimited resources or that we believed we could live on less, uh, there would be there could there could be a shift. Uh, the fact is that the 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 resource disparity on Earth is daunting. Um, I heard some crazy statistics, like in China, as China rushes to become uh, to raise its consumerism to the level of how it would take fourteen Earths to sustain it. So uh, it's the belief, you know, it, th this is what early MRI, the very first MRI study showed that the same brain areas were firing, whether the apple, you were told to imagine the apple or that the apple was actually, you were looking at the apple, the exact same brain areas. So within our, within our own psyche, belief is a powerful thing. And when you believe there's a threat, there is indeed a threat. And when you believe there's enough, there could be enough. Well, here's our colleague, David Anderson Hooker. Hey, David. He's asking, in your research, you use proof of racial bias at an early age, three months. You make a distinction between morphology, that is appearance, or construction, or a social construct of race? Uh, well, I was just using the, the way the literature was written. Um, 
all it really does is, to, is suggest, as uh, Cornell West points out, race consciousness, race awareness. Being given to that happens later on. Because just because you distinguish one race from another doesn't necessarily mean anything bad going on. But as you incorporate the cultural narrative that one race is better than another or one race is worse than another, then there lies the problem. All right, interesting. David, if you're still on and want to follow up on that, type it on in here. We'll go, we'll go with it later. Uh, any, uh, Tali Harrison asks, any neuroscience research on replicating brain-based tribal prompts to bind with, bond with or deepen intimate tribes? That makes sense? Uh, no, I've never... I've, again, these, um, I've had to infer a lot of my work from studies like that of Richard da Richie Davison in Wisconsin with the Buddhist monks, which is, ex it's fairly expensive and sophisticated. And usually the questions are not that refined. It is an interesting you know, question, isn't it? That was an interesting question, yeah. Selena Garcia asked, prisons are the monuments of our social, to our social failures. We need to learn from society that live without prison. So that's a comment more than. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, Diane Kushner asks, I very much appreciate we are sharing and have heard related analyses in a interpersonal neurobiology slash nonviolent communication program called New Deaths. I wonder about circle effectiveness when those participating don't also work on healing our own trauma. Mm. How do you see these co-developing uh, slash evolving in this work? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that's, well, you know, that's an important topic, the trauma topic. Yeah, the end topic. Um, you know, there are some researchers who say that African Americans are traumatized. Um, on our campus, uh, I had a re one of my colleagues across the hall, and just looking at a study, happened to, to provide a um, depression measure and found that half of the re, re, uh, students uh, had borderline depression. So um, dealing with our own stuff, well, um, I think that the not dealing with our own stuff is to our detriment. And um, you know that's why years ago when Nancy uh, Goodsider and I were doing um, diversity work, I, I became cured of, of the need for diversity. Uh, training, because it it uh, provided a PowerPoint presentation for something that is it needs to be done with you sitting uh, next to a lake just yourself. Uh, it can't be done that way. Um, so that that deep introspection and and healing of your own self, I think, is really what restorative justice invites in community. It's not like what all the work is going to be done while you're there in the room with the with these other people. Um, allowing yourself to feel this human empathy, this connection to each other. I think the invitation is then to go home and continue that deep work. David Anderson Hooker is back. Okay. Because it's not race, it's morphology. Or I see. Logical markers for race. If we get, can get clear that we're and be more refined in our language, that might help awareness of this challenge. You, you are absolutely right, David, and I applaud you. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates writes in his book, uh, he calls the people who know themselves as white. And he asked that we really change our language to, to stop this made up, because we've made this all up. And it's true, there is no biological, uh, the, mor the, mor the morphology itself is not as distinct as we have it be in our social discourse. And so the, 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 that's where I think our um, demarcations of the knowledge hinder us because there's a whole sociological view, then there's a biological view, and now I'm talking about a neurobi neurobiological view, right? Uh, getting a common language, a way to discuss this, without this meaning that we've associated with it for however many centuries is, is key. And Nina asks, coming up on that one, uh, have you come across communities here in the U.S. or around the world that are incorporating a form of restorative justice 
in ways that are healing for those in power and those who are victimized? In other words, where is this group? No, this is really why I'm, I agreed to have this conversation with you, Howard, because I want you to do that. <laughs> yeah, I want you to uh, take this, uh, because you, you've had to interact with these uh, power structures to even get as far as you've gotten inside of prison. So you're actually in the belly of the beast. Now I'm just asking you to go up into the head, down the arms, into the tail. <laughs> No small thing. <laughs> so the answer is no. I I'm, I haven't. Well, there um, there are communities where they've used circle processes to bring people in power and gang leaders and others together on a somewhat regular basis, mm -hmm. and they report some really increased communication, understanding, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also some situations where uh, a community that and plagued by police violence has been brought together with the police department to have a conversation around those issues. So there are examples of that mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in the challenge though. Yeah, and I don't know, you know, just in preparing for this talk, there, I don't know what the role would be of empowering oppressed people in, in restorative justice. Because when, when, you, when they leave the room, so you have bring the powerful and the disempowered into the room together and the power empowered go home to their life and the disempowered go home to their life mm -hmm. like what commitment is there about the the structural economic and political and social forces that keep the system in place so i'm deal i'm working here with the algebra project and i really think it's an interesting example of empowering people. It's 30 years old. It was created by a guy named Bob Moses, who was a ge is a genius. He actually got the Genius Award back in the 80s. Uh, he, he relates teaching algebra to teaching sharecroppers how to read before the civil rights movement. Like, and, and he actually did both. He actually did that. So he, brought, he brings the same strategies to teaching algebra because algebra, he says, is the literacy of the knowledge age. If you don't know it, you can't move on. And so um, it's interesting because in teaching these kids algebra and algebra concepts in a way that's relevant to them, he uses the way algebra before there were symbols had meaning. Algebra had symbols, had sentences. It, it, it had real world application. You can hold it. Before we just put it in books as symbols. He brings us back to that. And then he says anybody can learn it. And these students do, it's absolutely amazing. In so doing, he also teaches social justice. And he talks very much, These you get students teaching students about the need like to know, read the paper, to know what's happening, to be engaged in the political discourse. So this empowering of people, I think is part of restorative justice's job. It can, we cannot look at it as a, a meaningful dialogue and dialogue only with our actions that changed the social landscape. Yeah. Wow. All right, let me go back to the questions here. Okay. <laughs> I hope I don't murder those name people, Brad Resco from Boston. I'm in the process of completing a course with Dr. Minoxi Chabra on intergroup conflict transformation, which is how I learned about restorative justice in the Zara Institute. I would like to hear your thought on these three questions. One is reconciliation or restorative justice worth the pain of reopening old wounds? Mm. Two, do we have an obligation to look at the circumstances which led to the act committed against our person or against those we love? And three, can we have reconciliation without forgiveness? I should mention that my course, this course here has changed my perspective to the point where I'm ready to dive into this work and possibly a PhD. Wow. Um, wow. I'll answer the last question first because I believe that forgiveness is, forgiveness is the activation of the moral imagination. Forgiveness is the, the tribal expanding technique. Uh, forgiveness says that I can now see you as myself. So for, for, for forgiveness is the very act of, of bringing a, 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 another into your own world. So 
I think it's like critical to this whole this whole conversation. Um, I think our problem is that we don't know how to do that socially. I mean, I can I can do that personally um, and do that work, but how do we do it socially? And when you talk about opening old wounds, I, I assume that that's what you're talking about. When I used to do diversity training, you know, it was interesting that the the uh, minority people, the African Americans, primarily in the room would old wounds. Like they would they would discuss how these practices or policies or whatever had impacted them, clearly on an emotional, soul-wrenching level. And that information was received as a person getting information in a, at a conference. So you can see how with that disparity, there wasn't a real opportunity for discourse. So a restorative justice provides a different type of setting entirely. And I think that that is what's called for. So I, I applaud your wanting to be uh, to get your PhD and I hope that you put the narrative forward. I, I hope that you create the new knowledge that we need to how to bring this into social, social structures. Um, said, uh, well, there's a question, a, a comment here that the city of Santa Ana, Ana has implemented a restorative project such as uh, Project Kinship and created a group of men and boys of color. So it's a, given as an example, I guess, of some of the things that we were we were talking about before. Um, Phyllis Lawrence says that I second the promotion of AVP, the Alternatives to Violence Project, which ex exists in many prisons in the U.S. and many countries. As Howard knows, I started with RJ years ago. I've been an AVP coordinator with prison co-facilitators for eight years. And have seen the participants' attachment to differences such as morphological, religious, age differences dissipate. Your presentation, Cheryl, shows the real dovetailing, dovetailing of the values and positive effects of RJ processes and AVP, which substantially relies on circles. And I would add that uh, our students often participate in AVP workshops at Raterford Prison in Pennsylvania. So, mm -hmm. so any comments you want to add to that? This is more of a comment than a question. Yeah, I would just like to say how can, you, you know, in Ferguson, that report by the Justice Department talked about the, the city using fees imposed on the citizens for its own budget. I say to you, that's violence. And how do we engage them? How, how do we engage city managers? Uh, because this had, this had been a practice gone on for years. Um, and had there not been that shooting, would we know about that? Or would we care about that? What, what's happening on those levels? So for this, you know, I first named this talk uh, Restorative Justice 2.0. And I put that out there to Howard because I believe in the practices of RJ. I, I've seen it in myself when I lived in Harrisonburg. I know the power of this work, but I see the lack of it in areas that we don't normally consider criminal or do, we don't consider violent that have the effects. Yeah, it's so hard to get people in power. Yes. Open up around these things. Yeah. yeah. We have one more comment, and then we're getting toward the end, unless someone wants to pose another question here. Uh, Amy Foth Siebert, who, tossed, who asked a question earlier, says there are two ways to be happy, or get more or require less. <laughs> yes, I'd forgotten that the FR, MRI study with the imagine your real apple. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> uh, David Anderson Hooker says, I am a huge critic of AVP and other restorative process inside of prisons and schools because in order to continue inside, it seems that the institutions and the policies cannot be challenged. Mm. That seems to prop up an otherwise violent system. Yeah, that's a dilemma. Any comments on that? Yeah. Well, I, I just hate to repeat myself. I, I think this is the next uh, frontier for restorative justice to take that on. And maybe there needs to be some, I, you know, this whole idea of drawing from a source deeper than ourselves, maybe this cannot be thought through. Maybe this can't be figured out. Maybe there needs just to be an opening and a receiving of the next step of RJ. 
because honestly, I, I see what happens when leadership is left to its own devices. I mean, this, this, this political, this presidential race has been like crazy. I mean, it's just been, what? This is too wild. But, um, and, and this whole group of disenfranchised white people, I mean, that have now realized the effects of their being, you know, disenfranchised. So um, I think this whole speaking truth to power thing um, I don't know if it needs to start in elementary school and we just have a long, 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 long-term plan, but I think that there is a possibility. I believe in it because I think that it, it will save our planet. We cannot survive doing what we are now doing. Um, and so if we are to survive as a species, I think it's imperative upon us to use all of the resources at bay uh, and neurobiologically, I think we are primed to look up. Uh, that's at, at the end of the day, that's what I got from all of my studying and my own personal journey, that we, we are as a species primed to look up, to be, to be receptive, to be, to be engaged in something greater than just our tribal identity. And I believe that's the source of our answer. However, whatever method, that you use to get there. I don't know how we'll get there, but I believe we can. I know I've wrestled with this dilemma from the very start, you know, do by offering, by working within within this we started with the criminal justice system, we work we cooperate with it. Are we just making it work more smoothly? Yeah, right. we reducing our ability to speak critically to it. Uh, yeah, it's a very valid question. Yeah. And the questions are coming in again here. So <laughs> Well, I'll keep moving. Okay. Uh, Martin Applebaum asks, please consider that the very structure slash function of self as a project in which an isolated subject orients itself by positing separate objects that it wishes to grasp or avoid, even positing itself as such an object, I am this and I should be that, is a deeper than tribe in creating division and unending lack in oneself and with others. Undoing that endless and impossible to complete self project is what the Buddhist monks are directed towards investigating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, Joseph Campbell talks about the experience that we're all seeking. Uh, he thinks he calls religion metaphors for actual experiences that indigenous people and tribal people have incorporated into their practices. So the shaman actually went somewhere inside. I mean, there, there's an actual experience. There's just not knowing stuff. There's just not information. Um, and this experience, he says, is what's lacking in the modern world. And, and what he says that when you look at all these experiences, what they have in common is this dissolution of the self. So, so this idea that it is possible for, for, for human beings to experience somehow, some way, this selflessness that is at the core of who we are. Now, quantum physics backs that up with that, you know, at fundamentally all of this difference we're looking at is just the same stuff with different uh, is associated with it. But if you go deep enough, it is only one stuff. And that's what he says. If you go deep enough, there's I know <laughs> Here's another question, uh, and my apologies for stumbling. My eye condition makes it hard to read the stuff on the screen, oh, okay. and so I kind of stumble around here, but I'll try. David Snyder asks, since our sense of tribe and our connection to larger associated by various structures and connections between those structures within the brain and the development of these structures and connections depends on proper nutrition and avoiding exposure to toxins. Mm. What role does environment play in this sort of justice? Any thoughts about that, especially from your perspective in psychology and neuroscience, biology? You know, I, I read the thing at Flint and it brought tears to my eyes, no joke. Because yeah. it's a thing, that's a neurotoxin that you do not play with. Yeah. And, to, and to think that it was in the water of, of whole communities. I mean, it's, and this is the United States. I mean, it was just, <laughs> I mean, wow. Again, you have power structures that, that 
create situations like that. Um, and, bec and I believe that tribal affiliation was of it. That no self-respecting politicians whose own children were drinking that water would have allowed that to happen. Yeah. Well, we have one last question and then we'll start winding up here. Amy, coming forth, Siebert comes back with this is really, you know, we're interested to see what you say about this. <laughs> Head of GDP as an indicator for a country or global well-being. What would you use as a measure to orient people to an experience in relationships over business slash corporate slash system success? <laughs> wow. That's a tough one to end on. Yeah. You know, if there, if there could be a measure of a quiet mind, I would have that be the measure. Uh, so much of our structures, even with these young people making these six figures, you know, I have a daughter and son-in-law out in the Bay Area, all in up in IT, and and um, but oh my gosh, they work all the time, <laughs> like, um, and they don't even give themselves often uh, opportunity or or think it's wrong to not push themselves to that level. And what happens at the end of that day is when is there time for this introspection? When, when is there even opportunity for it? Because there's always running under not enough. And at the end of the day, uh, that is threat. At the end of the day. Sorry, you just answer me. So, um, yeah, quiet bind. If we could ever measure it. Could ever measure it. Oops. Nice <laughs> persistent there. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks so much, Cheryl. Uh, You're welcome. I really appreciate it, and I'm glad this is, there's a lot there to, to contemplate. And it's nice that this will be available online for people either who missed it or who want to hear it again and yes. and uh, think more deeply about it. Absolutely. Uh, so thanks so much. I'm going to turn it now to Sarah to wrap up, uh, or at least to do some announcements and so forth. And I'll come back and say goodbye. Thank you so much, Howard. Thank you. Hello. Back again. So my name is Sarah King, as Howard just mentioned, and I'm gonna um, I'm a graduate student here at the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and I work as the graduate assistant um, for the Zare Institute. And I have a couple of announcements regarding that and some upcoming events. So sorry, as I struggled to get all the slides in the right in the right spot. So um, tonight was our last webinar for the spring. And so we're gonna be starting up again on September 21st with pre-charge, pre-booking, restorative, um, restorative diversion, a spotlight on Oakland, California. And so that should be fantastic. All of these are also going to be at the same time, so 4.30 to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard. On October 19th, we're going to have restorative justice, restorative theology, and restorative, restorative church. On the evening of November 2nd, we're going to have Making Mana, a story about the failings of the justice system and a victim's efforts to heal. And then on December 6th, we're going to have Restorative Justice and the Practice of Law. So that is the lineup for our fall. And there will be emails um, being sent out for these. And also, um, you can register online on our, on our website. So we hope to see you guys around for those as well. Um, so we have a conference that's coming up. It's going to be very exciting. In the middle of June, the Zare Institute will be hosting um, Restorative Justice in Motion, Building a Movement, which will be held here in Harrisonburg. Registration is now open, so if you're interested, please do go to our website and take a look at that to see if you'd like to join. Um, it should be a really excellent conference. I'm very excited about it. Um, as you can see, there will be quite a few themes that, that'll be covered, and we hope that this will be an engaging and interactive, interactive experience for conference participants. The Center for Justice and Peacebuilding Summer Peacebuilding Institute is a four-week intensive during May and June offering 20 different courses. If you're interested in taking an intensive course on restorative justice, um, there are a few options available, but the truth-telling, reconciliation, and restorative justice is now full. Um, but I do think they have started a wait list for it if you're still, if people are still interested. Um, so that is also available to be signed up for online. And then there's also going to be Foundations of Restorative Justice offered online this fall. And if you're interested in that, Sarah Rothshank, who is our admissions director here, will be um, available. She, you can contact her if you have any questions or like to sign up. Then we also have STAR. 
um, which is Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience. It is a research-based training program that brings together theory and practices from neurobiology, conflict transformation, human security, spirituality, and restorative justice to address the needs of trauma-impacted individuals and communities. This program is great for individuals and organizations whose work brings them into contact with populations dealing with current or historic trauma. There are several opportunities to receive, receive STAR training. Um, level one is in May and September, and level two will be in May and November. And more information can be found online if you'd like to sign up. There is also a graduate certificate in restorative justice. This certificate is 18 credit hours with equal focus given to conflict analysis and practice, restorative justice studies, and electives which could focus on monitoring and evaluation, psychosocial trauma, or something else that you would like to study. The certificate can be completed through a number of courses offered through the annual Summer Peace Building Institute that I mentioned before, or through a combination of one semester on campus and one summer term. We also have restorative justice and education. There are two routes for this. Um, there's a master's in education with a restorative justice and education concentration. And there's also a 15 hour graduate certificate in RJ in education. And this can be used in a variety of capacities for professionals working in educational settings. There's also the Master's in Conflict Transformation. Um, this is a 45 credit program, 24 of which are given to core classes, and the rest you can elect to focus on one or more areas of interest. The curriculum is practice-based and ideal for individuals looking to be reflective practitioners within their chosen field. And lastly, we do have a wonderful website that's pretty new within the past few months, and this is where we post all of our webinars after they've been recorded and any events um, and upcoming activities that we have going on and ways to register for things that you might be interested in. So please do feel free to check that out. And that concludes my announcements. So here is Howard back again with a few closing remarks. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I thank for those. I hope on my screen, a lot of that was cut off on the screen. I'm hoping that wasn't true for everybody. And a lot of the information will be available on our website. Thanks for joining us. We have a whole series set for the fall again, and those are on our, uh, on our website. Uh, some really interesting topics again uh, scheduled. So join us uh, in the fall. And uh, thanks for being with us today. Uh, goodbye to everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Goodbye, Howard. Bye, Cheryl. Mm-hmm. <laughs>